Reminder, uh, we are in a sermon series where we are looking at uh, what are our five core values. Those were the big words that came across the bottom of the, the screen in that little video. And those five values are based on the original purpose statement uh, that the, the planters of Westwood Christian Church, they, they typed onto a type with a typewriter, they signed their names to those words, they sent them off to the state of Wisconsin and they said, we are starting a new church with this goal. Our goal today is, is, is basically the same thing. We've just simplified the wording, but those words there are, they have become the pillars of what we as a church are about. Today, we're going to look at the second of those, which is discipleship, the, the, the shaping of, of a disciple. How do we do that. Our, our, my sermon text for today is coming from 1 Timothy. We're going to be in chapter 4, verses 6 to 16. Paul says this, these things to his, uh, his disciple, as it were, Timothy. He says, if you put these instructions before the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, nourished in the words of faith and of sound teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with profane myths and old wives' tales. Train yourself in godliness, for while physical training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. Holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, for to this end we toil and struggle because we have our hopes set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. These are the things you must insist on and teach. Let no one despise your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I arrive, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhorting, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you through prophecy with the laying on of hands by the counsel of elders. Put these things into practice. Devote yourself to them so that all may see your progress. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Continue in these things, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and your hearers. About 15 and a half years ago, I received a package in the mail that was, uh, at the time, probably the most anticipated package I could have received. I was a senior about to graduate high school. I had dreams of playing college baseball. Up until this point, I had been praying and hoping, and yet I hadn't come to fruition. But in spring of 2008, I received a package which had a contract from Milligan College that said, we will pay you this, well, we'll give you a scholarship for this much money to play on the baseball team. Sign here. I signed and sent that back. And in that package, there was a booklet. Not really a booklet. It was a full-on book. It was, a, it was half an inch thick. And it was the workout regimen for that summer. I was already expected to, to be getting ready for baseball six months before I was even going to set foot in the locker room. They had a dietary plan full of, if you need to lose weight, here's the plan. If you need to gain weight, here's the plan. If you need to maintain weight, here's the plan. By the way, the gaining weight plan was 12,000 calories a day. I wished I needed to gain weight. <laughs> 
It was hilarious because the, the suggested breakfast was like two McDonald's breakfast burritos, a packet of Pop-Tarts, a bowl of cereal, and a couple eggs. And you're like, man, it's great to gain weight, apparently. <laughs> but then they had the whole summer, every day of the week, do this workout, then do this workout, then do this workout, then do this workout. And I will confess, I... I I didn't know how to do all those workouts. Luckily, I had a gym membership. I went to the gym and I said, um, how do I do this? They didn't give me instructions. They just said, do this exercise. I don't even know what that means. And over the course of that summer, I did as much as I could. Some days were better than others, to be sure. And over that summer, I put on 15 pounds of muscle. I was like, man, this feels good. Some of those weeks were really hard. Some of those weeks I felt like giving up. I learned a lot that summer, though, about persistence and hard work and physical training. I learned a lot about what was going to be expected of me in college. It's interesting to me that Paul tells Timothy that godliness, we might call that discipleship, the living your life like a disciple, being a godly person. It's interesting to me that he says this is like going to the gym. In fact, it's the same word as gym. Uh, the word train in, in Greek, uh, the, the verb is uh, gymnasia. Oh, gymnasium. That's, that's where we get that word. He says, go to the gym for your godliness. That's what he tells Timothy. He says, train yourself for godliness. Now, we like to think, I, I, I like to think, maybe you're smarter than me. I like to think that like, you know, the, the idea of physical exercise, going to the gym is a modern thing, but it's not. There were gymnasiums, they were called that, all over the Roman Empire, where people could go and they could exercise. They could get strong, they could get fast, they could get trained. This is a, this is a metaphor that Timothy is familiar with. Not too far from Ephesus is the Corinthian Games, the second largest um, a feat of athletic prowess, second only to the Olympics. They know what they're talking about when it comes to physical training. And then I love that, that Paul says, look, physical training is of some value, right? It's of some value. But he says, godliness is of value in every way. Holding promise for this life and the life to come. Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, uh, kind of a, a student of his. Timothy had, had followed Paul around. He had kind of been a, a, kind of an, an intern, to use a modern word. He had interned under Paul for uh, a couple of years. He had gone on a missionary journey with him. And, and, and finally, uh, late in Paul's life, Timothy becomes one of his primary um, uh, one of his primary uh, students and uh, fellow workers, where we actually think Timothy uh, perhaps delivers some of the late letters of Paul. Timothy may be the one who's, who's helping him handle the problem with Philemon. Timothy may be helping him handle the problem in Colossae in Ephesus. Why might Timothy be helping handle the Ephesus problem? Well, we know from chapter 1 that that's where Timothy is when this letter is received. He's at the Ephesian church. He, he's in Ephesus. There's probably multiple churches in Ephesus because they're just meeting in homes. They don't have buildings like this yet. So Paul writes him a letter and says, hey, look, you got to be careful. You got to be careful. Ephesus has all sorts of pagan cults. It was, we, we know this, we still have some of the archaeological remains of these temples to these deities full of fertility cults and, and, and all sorts of ideas about what was and wasn't true. 
And so from the beginning of this letter, Paul is telling Timothy how to lead a church in the midst of a culture that is so anti-Christian. This is why, by the way, this is why the, this, this is the, the letter that Paul says, here's how you select deacons. Here's how you select elders. Because Timothy needs to know how to do this. He's writing this to a friend of his. This is why Timothy is one of what we call the pastoral letters. It's Paul giving his support, his shepherding to his friend, his co-worker. And apparently there, there's a problem in Ephesus where there's this discussion, perhaps an argument, perhaps even worse, perhaps there's conflict over what is proper teaching. What is the truth? We often use the fancy word, our Bibles use it too, teach sound doctrine. Like, look, that's a bunch of jargon. What he means is teach the truth. Doctrine is just a, an old word that means teaching. Teach the truth. Teach sound teaching. Give good advice, he says. And what's fascinating to me is that uh, Paul, in his mind, he, he does not think that we need to know the right thing just to know the right thing. Rather, uh, if, we, if we jump back to chapter 3, verse 15, we, we, we hear Paul hopes to come to Ephesus and see Timothy. But he says, if I am delayed, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and bulwark of truth. You see, for Paul, his, his opinion, his, uh, his teaching is that if we know the truth, if we know good teaching, we will behave the right way. He says, look, this is not just about teaching good things so that you can be the smartest teacher. This is not about teaching sound doctrine just so everybody can go, yay, Timothy, you're so smart. The point is that we need to be teaching people how to behave in the kingdom of God. And that tells me that teaching for Timothy likely involves more than just standing up on a stage or whatever the first century equivalent would be and lecturing his people. That's not how gyms work, is it? Gymnasiums rarely have one person who just stands and talks while everybody else sits there and does nothing. It's rarely how it works. Unless you're the parent of somebody, like, I, you know, I'm often sitting doing nothing while my kids are in swim lessons at the gym. But that's not what he's talking about here. You see, the, the, the point that he's making is that for Timothy, he needs to teach people not just what to know, but what to do. And this is really important because we know that in the Ephesian cults, in the, in the temples of their day, they weren't just teaching people what to think. They were teaching them how to act. They were teaching them how to interact with one another. So he says, train yourself for godliness. Because we saw that there are profane myths and old wives' tales in verses 7 and 8. So he says, train yourself for godliness. For while physical training is of some value, godliness is valuable in every way, holding promise for the present life and the life that is to come. He says, I want you to, to, to work, to, to, to understand life, to understand in, in many ways, to understand church, to understand the community, to understand the kingdom of God as a gymnasium for piety, as a gymnasium for godliness, as a gymnasium for discipleship. The word discipleship, uh, that, that, that suffix ship, that has nothing to do with boats. It's an old English abbreviation for the word shape. So we might translate that word disciple shape, which is interesting, right? Because we talk about going to the gym to get in shape. I am a shape, it's just round. But we talk about going to the gym to get in shape. 
And Paul says, go to the gym to get in shape. But the shape that you're taking has nothing to do with your abs and your pecs and your biceps and your triceps and your quads and your hamstrings. That's not what we're talking about. He says, I want you to go to the gymnasium and get in shape of a disciple. I want you to take the shape of someone who follows the living God. So we train ourselves. And we allow ourselves to be trained. Right? It's, it's really easy for us to read the book of Timothy and, and see him talking about Timothy taking care of himself. But we have to remember that Paul's saying, model these things so that you can help these people whom you are serving so that you can help them become disciple-shaped as well. And, and here we get, in verses 11 through 15, we, we get uh, the things we must teach and insist on, Paul says. Let no one despise your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. He says, look, uh, don't let anybody look down on a young person. Don't let anybody look down on your youth. And there's also the implication, don't look down on the youth among you. But let those youth, let the young people be examples to everyone. In love, in conduct, in speech, in purity, in faith. Paul then, we get again in verse 13. Until I arrive, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhorting, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you through the prophecy with the laying on of hands by the counsel of the elders. Put these things into practice. Devote yourself to them so that all may see your progress. This is a big ask that he's making on Timothy. You see, the first, the first, set of the, the first part of this ask is, you know, be the kind of person they should, live, they should look up to, regardless of your youth, be the kind of person that, they, that these people will look up to. Insist upon these things. The public reading of Scripture to exhorting, that's encouraging and, and, and calling out one another to say, let's be better together. And to teaching to explaining, right? If you're, if you're baptizing new believers, they need someone helping them understand. They need someone who explains these scriptures to them. They need somebody who explains what it means to take the shape of a disciple. And then do not neglect the gift that's in you. What he's, what he's basically saying there is don't look down on yourself. Let me be very clear, the church, when, when the church, you know, a couple thousand years ago, decided what books we were going to put in our Bible, this letter gets picked as one that we're going to read and honor as Scripture. And I think that's because the church wants you to know not to neglect your gift. You have a gift. Now our elders may not have laid hands on you and prophesied upon you like, like they did for Timothy, but I believe that you have a gift given to you by the Spirit. Put these things into practice and devote yourself to them, Paul says, so that all may see your progress. What he's saying there is be humble enough to admit where you've grown. Right? If you have a social media account, if you have an Instagram account, you have seen the pictures that people post. This is me a year ago. This is me today after a year of going to the gym. Look at how much better I look. And Paul says, be the same way with your faith. Do not judge your old self for how you used to be, but rejoice in the progress you've made. You've come a long way, he tells Timothy. Do not neglect that and let the people see. One of the hardest things, let me confess to you, about being a young preacher, one of the hardest things is knowing that I am young, I will make mistakes, I will say things I should not say, I will think things I should not think, I will lead in ways that I shouldn't have done. 
And there's a big group of people who can all see that. There's a big group of people who I stay up late at night thinking, I hope they forgive me. What keeps me going is the progress I've made. What keeps me coming back is knowing that I'm better today than I was a year ago, than I was five years ago, than I was 10, 15 years ago. Even though you didn't get to see 15 years ago, Adam. But it's one of the hardest things, and he's encouraging Timothy not to neglect his own growth. You see, the, the goal, my, my goal as a pastor, as a minister, as a leader in the church, is to lead the church to provide opportunities for people to learn how to become better disciples. This is the reason that we, we do a number of different things. We have things like Sunday school classes and small groups where we hope that you are coming together, you're learning about Scripture, you're talking about how, how you might live out your calling of a disciple better. You're praying for one another. You are encouraging one another. But it's also why we as a church, we, we, we go out and we, we do things in our community, whether it's a, a, an event for our, you know, our, our elementary school or we come to them and say, we, we want to support you. We have a trunk or treat coming up where we get to do two things. We get to both serve our community, giving them a fun opportunity where kids get to wear their costumes and come to a safe place and rub shoulders with Christians. But we as a church get to partner with another church where we get to foster the unity. It's one of those values. We're going to talk about that in a couple weeks. Those are opportunities for us to practice godliness. Those are opportunities for us to go to the gym and go, I don't know how to do this on my own. Luckily, I'm in a class of people who were in this together. And it's okay with me if the first time or the second time or the third or even the hundredth time you come to one of those classes, you're the person who sneaks in and stands at the back of that class like, I hope nobody sees me. Right? Look, I, I mentioned earlier, I have a YMCA membership, you know, right over here. And we take our kids to swim lessons, you know, once a week or so. And it's, 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 it's funny because, you know, I, 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 having a YMCA membership doesn't make me healthy. Okay? If it did, they would have a lot more memberships, right? Like if that was all it took was membership at the gym, everybody be a member at a gym. But that's not what makes us healthier or in shape, right? I have to go there and I have to actually exercise. I have to actually uh, learn about how I can eat healthier and how I can take care of my body. I don't learn to swim better by bringing my kids to swim class and sitting there watching them swim. My kids can already tread water longer than I can because they're there doing it. When you, when you go to the, the YMCA, there's one uh, big room that has you know, big glass windows that you can look in and see. And it's, it's, it's common uh, that when you walk by that, there's a class in session in there, whether it's you know, Zumba or Jazzercise or uh, whatever. I don't, can you tell I don't go? Jazzercise, what year is it? Anyway. But the point is that, yes, there is somebody at the front of that class teaching the class, but they're teaching it through modeling, aren't they? We're going to do this. That's what Paul tells Timothy to do. Model your behavior. And you, even if you go to that class, you just sit there in the back and don't do anything. Doesn't help. It's literally better to go to one of those classes and struggle through every single thing they do than it is to not go at all. And the same is true of our godliness. The same is true of our discipleship, that it is better for you to come and struggle through a Sunday school class. I don't understand what we're talking about. 
I, 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 don't feel, I, don't, I don't know how to shake someone's hand as a greeter. I don't know how to pass communion trays. I don't know how to teach children uh, the, the good news of Jesus. I don't know how to decorate my car for a trunk or treat. I don't know how to help the local community. I don't know how to be a good neighbor. I don't know. That's okay. My, my hope, my dream, the, the reason that I am in ministry is because I want to model and I want to help you in the gymnasium of God to learn how to take the shape of a disciple. I, I'm not there yet. Let me be very clear. I'm, I'm not perfect yet. I, I'm not. Timothy wasn't perfect either. But the goal was to model. The goal was to go. So the invitation that I have for you is, will you come to the gym? Will you come to the, to, the, to, the, to the place where we get to learn how to be disciples together? That's what church is. That's what the community is. It's how do we grow together? How do we do that? With encouragement? With support? Good to see you. Glad you're here. How can I pray for you? And here's why this is important. Paul tells Timothy that if he can pay attention to himself, if he can model himself well, if he can, if he can show up and train himself for godliness, if he can sh to do the hard work to shape himself into a disciple, this is Paul's encouragement. This is not just, hey, it'll be good for you. Right? This, is, this is no small encouragement. This is massive encouragement. He says, in doing this, you will save yourself and your hearers. In being a disciple, in focusing on training ourselves to be like Jesus, in doing the hard work, Paul says, you will save yourself and the people who see you, and the people who hear you, and the people who come in contact with you. Your conduct, the, the, the shape of your life will affect the people around you. What a good reason to be a disciple. We have hope for the life that is to come. We have hope for the present life, Paul says, we have hope for our own salvation and we have hope of salvation for those around us, all by training in godliness. God, we thank you that you've given us a pattern, that you've given us a person whom we can look to. That's Jesus. We thank you, God, that he lived the life that we could not so that we could learn from his life, his teaching, his death, his resurrection. God, we pray that you would make us people who follow Jesus. God, I pray that you would give us the courage to show up to the class that we don't understand in learning about you. I pray that, God, whatever is holding us back from training ourselves in godliness, that you would help us to overcome that that we would show up and learn that God, through our discipleship, through our growth, through our becoming more like you, that people around us would take notice, that we would be so obviously different that they would have to say, how did you get like that? And we can say, through training for godliness. Thank you, God. Thank you for Paul, who writes this advice to his friend Timothy. Thank you for preserving it, that we might learn from it. Thank you, God, for hope in this life and the life to come. It's in the name of Jesus, the Son of the living God, that we pray. Amen. Amen.